Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Hoven, your host of the Difference Makers podcast. This is a place where people come together that are making a difference for those who want to make a difference. And that's you. We're bringing thought leaders together in a sense of fusion where ideas and concepts and personalities are all driven together into one place at one time. And this is no different. In this episode, you're going to see cool things from cool people making a difference. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Difference Makers podcast, where we try to make a difference in everyone's lives. And as you know, you probably already see there's something different about our set today. It's that we are not here with Dr. Jim Hoven. That's right. We've booted him. He is out. I have two more very special guests. Very, I won't say more special than Dr. Hoven, but very special. And uh, in fact, in the future, we might not even call this a Difference Makers podcast. We are potentially talking about a rebrand due to our magic Anita, who said we need to rebrand our name. But for today, here's where we're going to try to make a difference. We're going to talk uh, with Jessica and with Paige about a trial they had that is a multi-million dollar verdict and what it means to them, what it means to the person that we took care of, what it means to our firm, aspects behind this. This is gonna make a difference in the lives of people who may have a loved one that gets hurt. It's also gonna make a, live, a difference in the lives of attorneys who may be out there listening to this to hear uh, what our attorney's thoughts are on something like this that was a very, very good outcome. Now, the very first thing you'll know is that I don't like talking about money. And you guys know that from our prior podcast, you know that from prior advertising. Uh, but today we're going to do that. So I hope you will follow along. Before we do so, I would like you guys to introduce yourselves. Um, if you would tell our audience a little bit about what you do for the firm, um, where you're from, and anything else that you feel might be important. So why don't you start, Jessica? Sure. Thank you. I'm Jessica Schlotter. I'm the Director of Litigation here at Ramos Law and have been for a little over two years now. And I am born and raised Boulder, Colorado. Wow. Um, never left the state. And yeah. Now, I didn't ask you this before. Did you go to school at CU Boulder? Yep, undergrad and law school. Whoa, you are a true CU to the core CU person. Okay. Go Buffs. All right, all right. <laughs> Maybe Prime will like watch this and get a hold of us and tell us how wonderful you are. Okay, Paige, you? I am Paige Singleton, and I am the director of medical malpractice here at Ramos. Um, I've been practicing law representing um, individuals who have been catastrophically harmed uh, by the wrongdoing of others for about eight years now. Um, and I have the honor and privilege of giving my clients a voice inside the courtroom. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. And where are you from? Um, so I can't consider myself to be a native because okay. I was actually born in Houston, Texas. But okay. my family moved here when I was four. So Colorado is all I know. Wow. But you come from the land of great trial attorneys, Texas. That's right. right? All the all the people that put on all the seminars. Everything's bigger in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. So let's jump a little bit into this case. Um, why don't you start, just we'll ask you to start. Why don't you um, tell us a little bit about, uh, for some privacy reasons, there's aspects of the case that we can't get into in, in detail. Uh, I'll warn you of that now. Um, but why don't you give us a little bit of overview here on Mikey's case and what happened. And then um, Paige, maybe after Jessica talks a little bit about the case, uh, and, and what, by, what I mean by what happened is with the injuries that kind of led us there. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the final verdict and then how uh, that plays out and then we'll dive in a little deeper. So if you want to start, Jessica, about uh, Mikey and tell us a little bit about him and what happened. Sure. Um, Mikey is someone who had a very difficult life since birth. Uh, his mother was pregnant with twins and ended up losing one of the babies and then Mikey was born an entire trimester too early. Wow. As a result of that, he spent his first year of life in the NICU and ultimately ended up with some developmental disabilities, including cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. um, he made it despite all the odds and was 47 years old and living in a host home at the time of a motor vehicle collision that he was involved in. Let me interrupt you for a second to ask you, uh, before we go into the motor vehicle collision part of it, um, you mentioned that Mikey had cerebral palsy. Um, uh, and I want to clarify one part of the story. So he was a uh, part of twins. His other twin died at birth, but he made it. So I can imagine he was, uh, and his, uh, all children are special in their mom's eyes, but I imagine that was very special in that regard, huh? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and his mother, Monica, absolutely adored him, took care of him for as long as she could until she started having some health issues. And, and what degree was his cerebral palsy? Um, what was his functional level? His functional level was actually very high. He was independent in almost all activities of daily living. He was able to walk, go up and down stairs, get dressed, go to the bathroom. Um, more difficult things like cooking, cleaning, he would need a little help with. But for the most part, he was really independent. And, and in the independence part, I noticed that um, as part of the trial prep and stuff we were doing, there are pictures of him out at social events and stuff. I think the aquarium and some places like that. So he was able to get out into society and participate. Yeah, so during the week, Monday through Friday, he would go to an adult um, day camp for people with developmental disabilities, and they would take them on activities. So like you said, the aquarium, the zoo, local libraries. Um, he loved playing video games, things like that. He was extremely active. Wow. wow. Okay, so why don't you tell us about the crash itself, and then after that, I'll ask Paige to tell us maybe a little bit of the post-crash portion uh, and what went on from there. So what, what happened in this crash? Sure. So he was picked up um, by a volunteer of the day camp and from his um, host home, and then they were driving to the day camp for the day with a few other uh, passengers in a Kia Sorento. And the driver of his vehicle saw a piece of plastic or a bumper in the road and slowed down, might have stopped for that bumper, and before that driver knew it, he was rear-ended um, by someone driving, you know, almost 10 miles an hour over the speed limit who simply wasn't paying attention in a large Ford F-150. Wow. And so rear-end impact, Ford F-150, uh, and what type of vehicle were they in? A Kia Sorento. A Kia Sorento. That's like a van. Kind of, it's a very small van. Most people were surprised that there were seven people in there. Wow. So it's like a SUV with three rows. Wow. And then what, what happened after this collision? Um, so it was pretty significant impact, forced the Kia to do almost a 180 degree spin in the road, and there was objects flying everywhere. Both uh, vehicles were totaled, and uh, Mr. Hastings suffered um, a massive intracranial hemorrhage in multiple compartments of his brain that led to him being a spastic quadriplegic. Wow. Now, Paige, why don't you pick up there a little bit from the, and I know this becomes a critical part to the case later with some of the hurdles that we faced. Um, talk about after he got hit and, and these injuries and him going to the hospital. Sure. So um, the paramedics arrived on scene and they went and they checked out everyone who was in the Kia Sorento. Uh, many people were transported to the hospital because um, the because of the developmental delays that these individuals had, they had guardians, and so they weren't able to waive, you know, their um, being taken to the hospital by ambulance. Yes. Um, Michael Hayes or Mikey, our client, um, after the collision, he actually got out of the vehicle and he was walking around the vehicle. He was talking to the paramedics. He was talking to the police officers. Um, he complained of a headache of about five out of ten pain. And um, he also reported that he couldn't remember the collision, that he may have lost, briefly lost consciousness. Mm. Uh, but despite that, he was able to answer their questions. They asked uh, what his name was, and he was be able to say his full name. He was able to spell his last name. He was able to give his date of birth. Um, and so the paramedics thought he had a, a relatively normal uh, neurologic exam. They put that his Glasgow coma scale was a 15, which is normal. Mm -hmm. um, and then he was taken to the hospital by ambulance. When he arrived at the emergency room, um, the ED physician noted that he had an abrasion on the left side of his forehead. Um, and that became one of the big defenses in the case because the paramedics did not document that he had an abrasion on the left side of his forehead. They said that his head was atraumatic mm. and that there was no evidence of trauma. Um, the mental exam that the ED physician did, um, he did note that, that Mikey was having some confusion, um, and he gave him a 14 um, on the Glasgow coma scale. So it seemed like his cognition was slightly deteriorating. Mm -hmm. um, he was taken to CT because they just wanted to check him out to make sure he didn't have any fractures or bleeding in the brain. Um, and the CT showed, as Jessica said, that he had bleeding in, in four different compartments of his brain. So he had bleeding in his subdural space. He had uh, subarachnoid bleeding. 
he had bleeding in the intraparenchymal uh, region, which is the tissue of the brain. And he also had bleeding in his ventricles. He had intra, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, while he was in the CT machine, he had a major deterioration. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, he wasn't able to communicate. He wasn't able to speak. Um, his Glasgow coma scale dropped significantly. I think it went down to about an eight. Um, and he, you know, wasn't able to, he be, his right side became droopy. He wasn't able to, to move his right side. Um, and so at that point, neurosurgery got involved. He had procedures to, um, drain the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid from his brain because when you have that building up in your brain it's causing pressure in the brain which causes permanent brain damage so they placed um, a drain which is a temporary solution to get that fluid and blood out and then later on he had to go have a permanent um, shunt placed um, and he still has that today wow so he uh he went it sounds like from being ambulatory and talking at the scene to this deterioration that was almost like a cliff and when he got the edge of it he really went off the cliff it sounds like in the ct scanner is that accurate that's accurate okay and uh, you know i'll stop here uh, really fast to say something that is super important to me with our firm um, when you hear Paige and jessica talk about the injuries they know the injuries and this is the reason that i went into law i was that doctor taking people in the emergency department, watching these deteriorations, watching these traumas, and then going and testifying as an expert in these cases. And so often the attorneys didn't know the case, like you guys know the case and you know the medicine. And I love that so much about working with you guys, that you care to know about the injuries. And when I say they know about the injuries, I'm not giving lip service to this, they know the injuries. And that's one of the things, I'll jump to the end here, that makes a big difference in an outcome like this. I think juries understand when they're when the attorneys have explained the injuries properly, when they know the injuries, and they've gotten out exactly how things happen. And you guys were able to do that in this case. Um, let's so now. Now you have the stage. You know how this happened. You know our client Mikey. You know how he was injured. You know how he went to the hospital and how he began to deteriorate. I want to shift gears for a second, and I want to shift to the actual verdict. Um, Uh, because we're going to work then we're going to work backwards a little bit we're going to start at the end here with the verdict so jessica um you and Paige uh, were able to to take and explain what happened to mikey and explain what his future meant and and a jury ultimately awarded damages and how how much damages did they award um yeah so before i get to that there's three categories of damages that we can claim in a case um, economic like medical expenses past or future non-economic, things like pain and suffering, inconvenience, loss of enjoyment of life, and then physical impairment. Um, In this case, um, we decided to drop our claim for non-economic damages because it's capped in the state of Colorado. Um, So we only claimed economic and physical impairment. For economic damages, the jury awarded uh, 100% of his past medical expenses at about um, 5.6 million. And then um, about eight million in future economic damages, uh, according to our life care plan, things that he would need in the future, and then three million in physical impairment. Okay, now I'm really glad that you stopped to break that out and in, in, in how that happens. I know for attorneys that are listening, you will, of course, understand all the categories of damages and, and how they lay out and what they mean. And for non-attorneys that are listening, I want to dive in just, just briefly into each of those. Um, Why is it important for damages? Um, You mentioned a cap uh, we have in Colorado. So why is it important to get our damages put into particular categories and how do you do that? So why and how? Um, The why I think is based on our legislator, the Colorado Supreme Court, what we've ultimately determined is recoverable in tort cases Mm -hmm. or injury cases. Um, And then why we have caps some states do some states don't it's not really clear colorado's yes. is fairly low and um, though it's changing soon but mm-hmm. i still don't think it's enough mm-hmm. and then just I, our legislator has outlined that you know each of the three categories is important each of them are distinct for different reasons and it should ultimately make the injured person whole in the end if they prove and are awarded all three 
Right. Now, and, and to give a real concrete example on this one, um, if the, and, and then you'll really get the importance of caps here. Again, if you're a non-attorney listening or watching, this question I'm going to ask Jessica will, will show you how important this is that your attorneys understand this and do this well. Um, if this jury had awarded, so that total award was how much? A little under 19 million. Okay, we're gonna call it 19 million just for sake of, of simplicity. So if a jury had awarded you $19 million in economic damages or non-economic damages or impairment, I want you to put it in three categories. If they awarded economic, if they awarded non-economic, or if they awarded impairment, how much ultimately would the person get? So if the jury awarded an either economic or physical impairment, um, they would get the entire award mm -hmm. um, as long as it's recoverable under policy limits, things like that. Mm -hmm. If the jury put the full verdict, the full 19 million in non-economic damages, then after the caps are applied, it would be around 600,000. Know, 600, so Paige, so you see this a lot in catastrophic medical malpractice cases. I do, and unfortunately, our caps are even more unfair when we're dealing with healthcare providers and healthcare facilities in Colorado. Yes, um, talk we about that. don't have a separate cat. First of all, we don't have that separate category of physical impairment. That all goes under the same cap. So they combine non-economics and physical impairment, and it's one line on the verdict form. And those are capped at three hundred thousand dollars. Wow. So that is the most that you can ever get. It doesn't matter how catastrophic or permanent your injuries are. Three hundred thousand is the cap for those non-economic so, damages. So if you had seventy-five percent of your body burned, yep, and you lost your digits, and they didn't give you impairment, they gave you the the, uh, the economic, uh, non-economic, the pain and suffering, so to say, you're saying you would be limited to how much? Three hundred thousand dollars. Three hundred thousand dollars. You could be a, a child, you know, with with severe cerebral palsy. Un unlike Mikey, who was pretty high functioning, mm -hmm. we've represented children who they're never going to live outside of the home. They're never going to work outside of the home. They're severely impaired, and that's how they're going to live out the rest of their lives. Their impairment is worth three hundred thousand dollars in the eyes of the Colorado legislature. Although we did work really hard, and Dr. Ramos, you were a big part of that um, fight to get the caps increased recently. And we're really excited um, yes. that we did get an increase in both the medical malpractice and the general personal injury caps, but we still need to keep fighting because they're still not where they should be. Wow, um, in my opinion, we shouldn't have caps. Yep. We should leave it up to the jury. They take time out of their lives to sit there and listen to the evidence and evaluate what our client's damages are yes. and their findings should stand. The Colorado legislature shouldn't decide because they're not in the courtroom hearing the evidence like the jurors are. You are so right. I'm so thankful that we've started that process of getting some change. But, but I think that um, this point, and, and we're going to go on to another point here, is so critically important. Um, the way that uh, Jessica and Paige presented Mikey's damages at trial resulted in a better outcome because they literally dropped a category of damages, which sounds really weird when you're doing a case like this. They didn't even want the jury to apply a number to a category and they asked the jury not to because it could have resulted in if the jury had placed all this money for damages in that category, the person would have been capped at nearly nothing um, for for literally having severe brain bleeds in four different compartments of their brain. So uh, what a great trial strategy and a great job by you guys there. Um, let's talk about money for a second because this is the elephant in the room. You guys know that at, at Ramos Law, I'm not big on, you know, we don't run commercials where we say, I got this much. Um, you know, we, we get so much money for people. We don't do that. We don't put maps on the television stamping dollar amounts by clients despite getting, um, you know, millions of dollars of settlements and or verdicts in our firm regularly. We don't do that. As a, as a leader of our firm, I feel like I rob you guys a little bit because um, nowadays the mark of trial attorneys seems to be what you get, right? And it is. Good trial attorneys get great outcomes and you guys have done that. Um, so, and again, this is, this is an open forum here and it's an honest one. So I want to hear, is it hard to work at a place where we don't just preach money, 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 but we do care about it? We care that our clients get the most. We're not going to pretend we don't. We want our clients to get every dollar possible, but we don't, at least I don't base our success in that. I don't say you're a 
good trial attorney or you're a bad trial attorney because you didn't get X million dollars or you haven't got X million dollar verdicts or whatever. Um, is that hard to work in a place like that? Why don't you go first, Jessica? No, I don't think that's hard at all. Um, you know, my one of the trials I did last year um, for Ramos Law, I think I consider one of my most successful one and it's actually my lowest verdict. And that's because I was going up an insurance company who offered us $3,000 max. And we ended up, you know, getting a little over 100000 um, before interest and costs and all that. And, you know, that's way lower than $19 million, but it's way more than they were ever offering or ever going to get if we hadn't taken it to trial. And the jury listened to my client's pain and her story and believed her. And that's all she needed. I just got chills as you said that because uh, I get such great reward out of just fairness. And fairness doesn't have a seven-figure or an eight-figure or a two-figure number on it. It's just fairness, right? How do you feel about that, Paige? How does it uh, work at a place I like love that? working here at Ramos Law because I share the same values. I think that money is not, it's never the first thing in my mind when I'm representing a client. Um, and money is important. I'll explain why in a minute. But... Our goal, or at least my goal, when we're trying a case like this or we're litigating a case like this, is we're, we're there to tell our client's story. We're there to give our client a voice. And in this case in particular, our job was to show the jury why Mikey's life mattered, despite the fact that he had cerebral palsy and was disabled and he wasn't like you or me, but that his life was very meaningful. And for me, it was life-changing to be able to, to tell his story. Um, money is important though. And, and really when someone's been harmed through, you know, by the negligence of someone else, the only thing we can do in our civil system is give them money. We can't give them the ability to walk again. We can't give them their lives back. And in Mikey's case, this money could make a huge difference for him because currently he's living in a long-term care facility. He's not getting all the treatments he needs. He's not getting occupational, physical speech therapy right now because they determined that he's not benefiting from it. Mm. But from talking to his mother and she testified to this in trial, he is improving when he gets physical therapy. And so now that, you know, he's going to get some money from this lawsuit, I think that it's going to, you know, significantly increase his quality of life. Wow, that is cool. And that's how you make a difference, like right to the nth degree, right? Just learning to, we, we forget if we've never been injured, if we've been blessed our whole life to be able to speak, um, to be able to get therapy for when you can't speak, to try to, you know, give words again. And I know that uh, Mike even testified in trial from his hot, from his bed, right? From his care rehabilitation facility bed, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Um, we had WebEx through the court system. It was a little rocky, but ultimately he got to, you know, see the judge, which made him really excited. He loves authority figures, police officers, things like that. Wow. Um, his mom was a little worried about him testifying and the stress of it all, but he was determined. He really wanted to do it, wanted to say hi to everyone. And he has this stuffed animal elf that he has with him at all times and introduced him to the jury. And he did. I think he found it pretty rewarding. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Um, one last question on the money thing, then we'll move on. Um, how do you guys feel about, okay, so let me back up here for a minute. Attorneys, particularly that do what we do, we take care of catastrophically injured people, uh, and even non-catastrophically injured people, we take care of anybody with an injury to help them out. Um, we get this label, you know, you, you've heard it, ambulance chaser, um, you know, some of the say attorneys are bottom feeders, uh, you know, it's always, I'll, I'll go first here. This has always really bothered me. It's bothered me because I'm a doctor at heart and I love to take care of people. And when I realized how much attorneys took care of people, what attorneys helped people out of, it changed my whole perspective of attorneys. When I was just a doctor, I remember thinking, oh, those attorneys. <laughs> and with time, I still, I really, really gained this massive respect for attorneys and what they do. They're caretakers in their very own special way. First of all, would you guys agree with that much, that attorneys are caretakers? Absolutely, and we're counselors. We're there to be there for our clients, to listen to them, yes. to hold their hand every step of the way. Yes, yeah. So, so tell me this, how does it make you feel then, or how do you respond to this perception that it's all about the money if you're an attorney? How, go ahead, Jessica, start with that. How do you respond to the perception it's all about the money for attorneys? Um, I mean, 
money, obviously, everyone has to have it in mm -hmm. some way or another, but it's certainly not even top of the list for me, and it's definitely not top of the list for the firm. Our priority is to take care of people, to help them in some people's darkest moments of their lives. Injuries can be debilitating and, you know, change people, and we're here to help them. And we're able to help them in ways that they wouldn't be able to receive that help without attorneys. Mm -hmm. So many insurance companies out there are, you know, denying claims for no reason at all. Right. So many insurance companies are offering 10% of the medical expenses and not considering impairment, pain and suffering, things like that. And so many people and firms are acceptant, acceptant, accept that. Mm -hmm. um, because they're not willing to put in the fight. Right, yeah, exactly. How do you feel about this perception of attorneys and money? Uh, what's your thoughts? I, I agree with everything you said, Jessica. I mean, I, I agree with everything Jessica said. I mean, clearly, at least from my perspective, and I think for most personal injury lawyers, it's it's not all about the money. Um, obviously, you know, money is necessary to run a business, mm -hmm. but that's not why we do it. There's lots of things that we could be doing and probably making more money than mm -hmm. as a personal injury lawyer. We right. do it because we care about people and, you know, we want to get them the best result and result oftentimes means money, but I've gotten thank you letters from clients where we've lost their case because they felt like we gave them a chance um, yes. and gave them a voice and they were happy to be able to tell their story and the process was therapeutic for them in a way. I can understand why people have the perception that, you know, it's all about money for personal injury lawyers. And I think a lot of that comes down to the commercials that they see on TV, which is why, you know, Ramos Law, you know, doesn't do it that way. Because there's a lot more to the story than that $350,000 check that you see right. on the TV. Um, when you see these commercials, you don't know the story. You don't know the background, what that person went through, what their injuries were. Yeah, and it always drives me crazy on those commercials. You know, it shows like somebody sitting on their new motorcycle talking about how much money they got. Right. It shows them <laughs> sitting in this background of a new house. You can see it's all perfect and how much money they got. And it's, again, while money is important to take care of people for their many needs, um, I think that when, when people realize that what we do it for is the person so they can do it, not so that we give them the money whether or not they can. We It's the way that we can help them. The advantage I've always felt as a medical doctor in my first career um, that I didn't have to deal with, and I didn't realize this until later on uh, in my practice, was as a doctor, you give people back their health. So doctors are heroes because we give you back your health. You came in, you had a lung infection, or you had an arm infection, or you had a laceration, or you had a gunshot wound, and we fix that. And so we get this reputation as kind of like being heroes. Everybody does, you know, they don't say bad things about their doctor because what we gave you back was your health. But when people get into a fix where they can't pay a bill or a corporation's blowing them off or somebody's not giving them what they rightfully deserve, what they paid for, they paid for a benefit and they're not getting it. See, that's what attorneys give people back. We give them opportunity for the future. We give them what they paid for and we keep people honest. And I, I sometimes feel like we don't get credit for that, for the people that want to keep the stereotype of attorneys. They, you know, there's that saying, right? Nobody likes attorneys until they need one. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, my two cents. Okay, my two cents on that. Um, uh, I want to jump back a little bit to um, the trial itself. And we're bouncing back and forth a little bit here because there are some areas that are very legally oriented here. There's some areas that are personally uh Directed, this is kind of going back to the legal aspects here. Um, what was necessary in Mikey's case? Uh, it's not like all of a sudden he's injured and we're in trial. Uh, give me some of the steps early on, just generically 10,000 foot view, Jessica, uh, that happen in a case like Mikey's where he has these injuries, he has his brain bleed, he actually goes on life support. They don't even know if he's gonna make it for a while. Um, what happens from there to trial? It's, uh, there's, there's a massive, there's years there. What happens during that time? Yeah, there was about um, two years in that time period. He was injured in March 2022, um, came to us in July or August, and we actually um, expedited this one. And it was a lot faster than it normally is. It only spent about three months 
in pre-litigation where we were trying to figure out who all the people involved might have been, what happened in the crash, who might be responsible for what happened to him. And we weren't getting responses back. And we knew how critically injured he was um, and weren't sure the full extent of it even at that time, but knew that we needed to hurry the process. So filed a lawsuit um, after only three months. And then once that um, time period started, we had four corporate defendants involved and two individual defendants. Um, it was it was a mess of parties trying to figure out, you know, we had one party advertising on the Ford F-150, what was their role in this? We had another party who might have been contracted with a larger corporation. What was that larger corporation's role in all this? So we spent a lot of time in discovery. Um, we took between all the parties taking depositions, I think it was close to 20 or over 20 depositions, wow. and then fighting with motions and all that. So it, it took a while with one continuance of the trial date and then finally got it to trial in April of this year. Wow. Now, Paige, explain a little bit um, the motions work, uh, the discovery work that goes into a case like this. Um, when Jessica says there's this period of time where there's all these depositions and stuff, uh, give, give our audience a little overview. Remember, not everyone's going to be an attorney watching sure. this. Yeah. Sure, yeah. And so in this case in particular, um, it it may have been the most discovery I think I've ever seen in a case, or at least very close to it, especially for a, a personal injury case. Now, I've had medical malpractice cases that definitely rival this one mm -hmm. with the amount of discovery, but this one was a lot. Keep in mind that we were up against six defense firms. Wow. Six different firms on the other side. Wow. Um, at, you know, at one point in time when we had all the parties in, we had six defense firms. And so the way that discovery works, so the discovery period is after the case is filed and all the defendants have answered um, and before it goes to trial. And that's when you're trying to do your information gathering. Um, and so you do what's called a deposition where you question the parties and their experts under oath. Um, and try to figure out what happened here, not just in the collision, but who are all these companies and how are they related to one another and who actually is responsible here? Yes. Um, and so that was a big part of this case because we had so many corporate entities. We released some of them uh, before trial, dismissed them because we realized that they, you know, we felt like they weren't culpable or they weren't actual employers of the individuals involved in the car crash. Um, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of that, just sorting out what exactly happened and who's related to who and who should be responsible, who are we bringing to trial. Um, there's also a big component, and here we're dealing with really complex injuries. Um, so there's a big medical component to the discovery process. And, you know, each party has an opportunity to do what's called expert disclosures. So in this case, we had to retain several expert witnesses, uh, both on the medical side as well as damages experts who came in to, to do what's called a life care plan for Mikey, you know, what he's going to need for the rest of his life, and then, um, you know, price that out so they could tell the jury exactly how much money it's going to take to pay for his medical treatment for the rest of his life. Um, and is that, that's like if he needs catheters. Right. What's catheters, a lifetime of catheters Wheelchairs. Cost? Okay. You know, everything. Therapies. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we did, and we had a, a life care planning expert. And then, of course, the defense they retained their own experts who came in and challenged Mikey's injuries. And in this case, um, there was a big dispute over the cause of his brain bleed, the cause of his intracranial hemorrhage. And so the defense medical experts said this wasn't related to the collision. It wasn't caused by the collision. Um, and they threw out several theories um, that we ultimately debunked mm -hmm. um, with our experts and during, you know, by deposing them. Um, but their theories were, hey, he just had this spontaneous bleed. This was his um, day to have You know, he just bleed. had a spontaneous bleed <laughs> because he had low platelets. And, um, you know, because of his medical conditions, he was prone to spontaneous bleeding. And that's what just happened right after this collision, this big coincidence. Um, they also threw out theories that something must have happened to him after the collision, which is why the abrasion wasn't present when the paramedics um, examined him, but it was present when the ED physician did. So something must have happened to him either in the ambulance or when he got to the hospital. Um, and then there was another theory that he had had a, a stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, 
unrelated to the collision. And so we had to deal with a lot of that and, you know, took one of their uh, medical experts deposition. Uh, We also, they had a life expectancy expert who came in and testified that our client was going to die um, in eight to 10 years and that uh, the collision actually took years off of his life, which I thought was a pretty bold defense. Um, it's not one that I would have, um, wow. you know, made if I was on the defense. I probably would have gone with a different strategy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so is it sometimes, it's got to be hard um, to hear, you know, a guy gets in a crash. He's got bleeding in four compartments of his brain. And then you get told by the other side, oh, this just was his day that it just happened. And then you get told things like, well, basically it sounds like, and I'll say this in my own crass way here he's handicapped anyway he's going to die early anyway that's got to be pretty tough to hear how do you deal with that how do you deal with that without how do you deal with that without getting angry i know you sometimes get pissed i've seen i love it when 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 jessica gets pissed watch out all hell comes down it's awesome um but how do you i mean what do you do with that anger how do you deal with that that's frustrating it's incredibly frustrating and yeah um I'm still working on how to deal with it. (laughs) Um, This case especially took a toll on me emotionally, um, even a little physically. I find it hard to eat during trial, and I have lived and breathed this case and Mikey's story for two years. Wow. Um, So this one impacted me a lot. What happened to him was egregious, and we never thought that causation of his injuries was going to be disputed, brought up, fought, and then their theories were outrageous. And they brought it in with experts who, you know, I don't think they even believed them. One of their experts seemed sad and frustrated during his deposition. The other one refused to even be deposed. And they ended up not even calling them at trial because I think they didn't believe their own experts. Wow. Um, so it, it can be really hard. Um, you believe in your clients and you believe in their injuries and what they've gone through and you're fighting for them, it's hard to separate yourself from that. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that, Pete? Uh, so it's really, it's really difficult as a lawyer to control your emotions during trial and you don't shut them off because you need to have those emotions mm-hmm. to be an advocate for your client. You just have to channel them um, into cross-examining the experts and you know, putting on a fight for your client. I think one of the challenges for our client's mother, who was present for the entire trial, and this is, you know, when I talk about a lawyer as a, as a counselor or as a, you know, a support for a client, we yes. had to do that with Monica during the trial because she had to sit there and listen to a lot of this. She had to wow. listen to these crazy theories out of the defense attorney's mouth. She had to listen to the life expectancy experts say that Mikey had a short life expectancy regardless of the collision and he was going to die within 14 or 15 years anyway. Mm-hmm. And it was really hard just to, you know, assure her like hey you know we understand that this is difficult to listen to but you need to keep your cool because we've got this and then she saw you know when we would go up and question the witnesses that Jessica and I knew everything about the case we knew everything about Mikey and we were able to significantly impeach their testimony because we were so knowledgeable about Mikey we read every page of his 30,000 plus pages of medical records wow wow you guys know um I, I think I've told both of you before. Um, I don't think I've ever had a chance to tell our viewers uh, this. So one of the things that's frustrating to me, that, that's frustrating for me as an attorney as well. Extremely frustrating. It's doubly frustrating for me being a doctor. And the reason is that, you know, I took an oath to help people with everything that I ever did. And I took that oath seriously. Like if I, if somebody had the, you know, let's just say they need four more physical therapy visits or did they not? I just treated it like it was my mom. I'd be like, hey, what would I want my mom to have? But, you know, give her four more. I just can't hurt her. I would always want the best for them. The very, very best. Uh, the hardest uh, things were, well, pretty much every night when somebody would die in the department. And, um, you know, you just go, you always relive, man, what could I do differently? What, you know, it's just like this never ending kind of mental torture of what can I do differently to help that person, to help that person, to have made that better. Especially when you see the pain in their family's eyes, which it brings, this is what brought the thought back when you said about Monica and having to hear and see this stuff about our son. And so anyway, what hurts me in these cases, what bothers me emotionally in these cases is that my fellow physicians who took an oath to always help people 
to give people the benefit of the doubt, to be there for them in their hardest times, will sometimes stand up and give outrageous opinions. Like, I mean, a doctor that would say that a guy who just been rear-ended by a Ford F-150 hard enough to total the vehicle that he hit when the other car is small that this person's in and then they get a spontaneous brain bleed it just magically happens in four compartments not just one but four and what we mean by four compartments is it's kind of just make it simple you know above the brain below the brain within the brain and within structures mm-hmm. within the brain just spontaneous it just happened that was the day now an attorney will, I mean, I'm sorry, a doctor will go opine to that and say that kills me. But these doctors make tons of money. Tons of money. What, 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 what do the average experts in a case like this on the defense side make? You don't have to know the exact amounts for this particular one, but what, what do they get paid? I mean, we've heard numbers from defense experts making 500000 to a million dollars a year just providing expert opinions for insurance companies. I think these experts, um, one of them was around $45,000 just on this case. Fine, and you see the same in the med mal cases, or even worse, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I've seen um, experts bill as much as $80,000 in one case. Amazing. One expert. Amazing. Yeah, it's not unusual for us to want to take the deposition of a doctor to explain a, a person's injuries, and for the time of their deposition, for their prep, and their deposition, we get a bill for $5,000. That's like for an hour or two, and we'll get a bill for $5,000 because they have a minimum sometimes. It's like this much to like get my time, whether it's a half hour or an hour and an hour prep. Um, it's amazing. And that that's disheartening to me. So I was just curious as to you guys what was disheartening in a case like this, and you guys have done well with explaining that. Um, two quick things here, and then we're, we're almost getting to the end here. I, I hope that that you're getting a little perspective on on this case and again uh, what it takes to get there you know mentally physically emotionally trial prep wise tell me a little bit about when you go to tell a person's story and i and i don't really like the word story because it sounds like a lie you know and it's not that it's really telling what happened to them how do you do it without sounding like you're whining why don't you start this one page uh, you know you're in there and you're you're talking about Mikey needing catheters or needing assistance or needing a wheelchair van or needing whatever. Um, but sometimes it's not always that severe. It's not maybe a catheter or a wheelchair van. Sometimes it's they might need physical therapy a little bit or they might need a medicine maybe. How do you do that? What's your, this is a legal question I'm asking you now, what's your legal strategy for telling a person's story sure. in a fair way? Yeah, I think in this case, in particular, we really didn't have that challenge Mm -hmm. um, because of how catastrophically injured Mikey was. And I don't think that anyone saw him as a whiner or a complainer or, you know, here asking for too much money because he did have serious injuries. But that's rare. I mean, we have a lot of clients that are not nearly as injured as Mikey. And it is difficult to come up with a strategy where you're not going to upset the jury by making them believe that your client's just here to get a, a check and you know that they're they're whining they're over exaggerating their injuries um in my experience the best way to tell what hap- to tell the jury what happened to your client and how their injuries have significantly impacted their lives is through lay witnesses not through the client himself or herself but through their family members, their friends, mm. their employers. Yeah. Hear it from the people who are observing them. Right. Um, so that's that's my strategy, as well as putting on the medical experts to explain why uh, the client is having this pain, is having this limitation. Well, yeah, that's good. What do you think about that, Jessica? Yeah, I definitely agree. You tell it through the other witnesses, and I think that helps um, the perception that someone is whining or greedy. And then ultimately you have to spend the time to get to know your client. Mm. A lot of the times we're lucky that we spend years with these people, though the injured people probably don't think it's lucky (laughs) to spend years with us. Um, But we spent a lot of time with Monica. I went down to the hospital and spent some time with Mikey, um, did calls with Mikey and just got to know him and his story. And I mean, Monica herself is absolutely incredible. She's incredibly smart and remembers every single little detail about him and his life. And it made it really, really easy just to tell the facts Uh and be honest. And I think if you just tell it like it is and you you don't lie, you don't exaggerate, then the jury is going to believe you and trust you and trust in your client. Yeah, that that's really good. The um, because, uh, you know, as I hear both of you guys say that, 
uh, it's not like their boss doesn't get up and lie for them. It's not like their friend's going to get up and lie for them. It's not like their family. You know, it's a whole constellation of people. And to say that it's a lie is to say that all those people are liars, right? So and that, that then gets you to the truth. I think that's an important thing, um, too, for our audience to hear is we make it a point here at Ramos Law. You know, we live by the principles. We don't lie, steal, or cheat. And we don't need to. We just need to tell the truth. And um, you know, the truth will set you free, as they say. And that um, that's really important to me. I, I think, I feel like you guys did a wonderful job in this case just telling the truth. Not just telling the truth, but getting the truth out there. Sometimes it's hard to get the truth out. How do you get the truth out there that the bleeding is from a crash and not spontaneous? How do you get the truth out there that he's not so handicapped that he can't function you know, before? Uh, you know, he was perfect before. Not perfect, but uh, in his own cerebral palsy way, he was able to get out and enjoy the zoo and enjoy public functions. Right now he's trapped in a bed. And how do you get that truth out there so that it doesn't end up with a lie? You know, I think we all know that partial partial truths are, are deadly. And I think sometimes we face that from the def insurance defense companies in cases like this. They tell a partial truth. Yeah, it's cerebral palsy, but come on. How functional was he and how functional is he now? That kind of a thing. So that's really important. Tell me, what was your biggest hurdle in this case, Jessica, that you felt? Was it, was it, and, and this this question, I'm asked both of you guys this, what was your personal biggest hurdle in this case? And the reason how I want you to look at this question is this. It can be emotional, it can be you personally. You've already kind of alluded to a little bit how hard this was for you to deal with, Jessica. It could be legally the motions. I mean, Paige, you mentioned that probably as many motions and discovery hearings and you know challenges and stuff as you've seen. Um, six law firms on the other side. Wow, against just us. Um, you know, how, so there's a lot of hurdles I'm sure that we can talk about legally or emotionally, physically. You know, what was the biggest hurdle? Is it, is it stamina to get through something like this? That's one of the things I wanna talk about before we end. Um, but what is the biggest hurdle that you faced in Mikey's case? I think the biggest one was finding a responsible party. Hmm. We had so many different defendants and not a single one of them stood up and said it was me and I'm sorry. Wow. Um, even at trial, we walked in and we had a defendant look at Monica and say, I'm sorry, but then he still said, I'm 0% at fault. Wow. So I think- They're all just pointing the finger at each other? Everyone pointing the finger at each other, corporate defendants saying I'm not responsible for this defendant, um, even though the facts and evidence clearly showed that they should have been. Mm. And then we're left with a lot of defendants who did not have any insurance and the other ones who were very severely underinsured. And we have a client who, who needs help. Mm -hmm. and he's not able to get it and we hope that since we took it to trial and we're willing to fight for him that he will be able to get that help now yeah that's fantastic what was the biggest hurdle that you personally faced sure in so it's, it's kind of twofold um, the first is the stamina and I will just say that you know Jessica and I both I think from beginning of this year January 1 through the trial um, in the beginning, we were at least committing 40 hours a week to this case. And then that went up to 60, 70, 80 hours a week by the time of trial. And we had to balance that with all of our other cases, our families, everything. Right. And that was really difficult. And wow. it seemed like this case in particular had so many twists and turns with rulings, a lot of them that were adverse to us and our client that we had to deal with. Um, and we had a corporate defendant um, where you know the, the trial judge, I think, incorrectly um, dismissed them from the case three weeks before trial mm -hmm. um, on summary judgment and we're appealing that and we think that we're going to prevail on that on that claim but we had to deal with this three weeks before trial we had our biggest defendant dismissed from the case as we were trying to prep for trial and we had to redo our entire trial strategy when we were still licking our wounds from that bad order wow. and we did it and we yeah. were able to immediately mm -hmm. jump on it and get our witnesses rescheduled make this go from a 10-day trial to a five-day trial wow. and get this case to trial on time wow yeah, so here you work on this on, on on something that's gone on for literally years, but three weeks before you have to adapt, change, bend. Hmm, that's incredible. Tell me about um, the, and I'd like you to start with this one page on the stamina part because I'd like people that are watching this other, if you if attorneys are watching this who don't try a lot of cases, I think you'll find um, you know this part to be helpful um, because there are a lot of attorneys who don't try cases. 
And if you're a person who wonders what happens with trial attorneys, um, or if you've been in trial or you've watched a trial or you've been on a jury, uh, I want to give you a little flavor of reality here on what it's really like, what a typical day is like. Because um, what happens is, is that sometimes, not sometimes, all the time pretty much, they're, you, you're presenting witnesses, the judge is on you that they're in a particular order, they're kept in a particular time period, that there's no downtime in the court, you have the pressure from the court that way, you have the pressure from the opposing counsel, sometimes objecting to particular witnesses or trying to limit particular witnesses. Then you have an issue that comes up, a law or legal issue, and then all of a sudden there's a sidebar or a, during a break that gets argued. Um, sometimes there's motions that are filed then that evening and they're we're supposed to write a response and have that presented to the court the next day. There's a lot that goes on here. Explain that to me. I've given just a cursory overview there. Um, how do you deal with that? Like because that is, I mean, it is tiring. Like what? What's a typical day? Do you get up to head to court at six thirty? Kind of lead me through that. Sure. Yeah. And I want to start by saying, you know, this it takes a team. Mm. It takes a village really to try a case like this. And so it's not just Jessica and me. It's numerous people at this firm who assisted with making sure that we were able to do that and making sure everything came together, having our witnesses there on time so that we didn't have gaps in you know witness testimony. Um, and so Jean, the paralegal who worked with us on, on this case, was very much a part of the team, and we couldn't have done it without her. Yeah. But it's not just Jean. I mean, it's other people at this firm. Uh, Samantha, my paralegal, who was making sure my other cases were handled while I was dealing with this case. Um, and so it was. this was really a firm-wide effort. Um, but going back to your question, in terms of what it looks like during trial, I was waking up every day at 4 o'clock in the morning, um, making sure I took care of everything at home. I would get to the courthouse by 7.30. Uh, we usually had arguments or some kind of legal issue that we needed to address with the judge before we continued on with the trial uh, each day. And then I think almost every day of trial, the judge kept us there until about 8 p.m. so that we could deal with jury instructions and other legal issues. And then after that, we would go home and we would prepare for the next day. And so we really were only getting yeah. four to five hours of sleep if we were lucky. I think Jessica was getting less <laughs> some nights. <laughs> um, but really, I mean, as it, for the attorneys that are listening to this, it's really important to prepare your families um, when you're go going into a trial like this and yes. to warn them months in advance, hey, this is happening and I'm really going to need your support while I go through this and I really need you to understand, especially if, if you have kids at home, I need you to understand that I'm going to be away and it doesn't mean that I don't love you, but this is really important for me to help Mikey. Um, and sometimes I'll tell my daughter a little bit about my clients and what I'm doing and she really understands why I need to be away you know, from home to, to yes. do this and to, to fight for my client. That's awesome. What, what do you feel about that, Jessica? Yeah, I absolutely agree with all of that. It, it can be really hard. It's hard for us and it can be hard for the people around us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was, I was up until 2 a.m. most nights, really didn't sleep much at all, just thinking about everything that I needed to consider and change. And then I would get up again and be like, okay, let me change this slide of my closing and mm -hmm. let me talk to our trial consultant about this. So it's definitely, it was a lot of work and it was a lot of work for about the month before and then especially the week of, and you know, you just, you get through it and mm -hmm. it's incredibly rewarding at the end. Yeah, the reason I wanted you guys to talk about that, um, again, because this is a misconception I had as a physician prior to being an attorney, was that, um, you know, I, I had been on jury selection before. When I walked in, uh, there, um, you know, the courtroom's kind of set up, and you walk in, and you walk into the box, and then something happens, and you leave. Or if you've been on a jury before, you know, when you come in, it's kind of set up, and, and you walk in, and you leave. I didn't realize everything that went on before, during, and after. And once I became an attorney, see, I always felt like, oh, doctors have it so rough. We are after shifts for hours with a patient who's continuing to bleed or the wound that needs to be resewn, or the, the case that you're still resuscitating for hours after your shift has ended. And, oh, we've got it so rough, oh, we've got it so rough. And you guys just put on a nice suit and look pretty and go to trial and you're done. When I became an attorney, I had a whole new respect. It's like, oh my gosh, your day is never done either. It's just a different version of the bleeding. And what, what attorneys have to live with, you know, as a physician, you have to live with when you lose someone and what it feels like to explain to their family that they've died and to, and to wonder what you could have done differently. As an attorney, you have to live with, have you taken care of them? What if you lose? How are they taking care of for life? What if you didn't get them enough? 
to buy their catheters, to get them speech therapy, to, to get them the help they need, right? What is, how do you feel yourself, right? And that's, as a doctor, that's how you feel if you lose someone as an as a attorney. It's no better. It is no better. It's, uh, it's something that I really hope people understand. It, it's really important. Okay, I want to end with this. Um, if you could give me kind of a... A post-trial summary. You know, I put in my notes here. I wanted to ask you guys about damages and, and the compensation. But I think this is better discussed in kind of a summary, like a kind of a post case. So you've just gotten a nineteen million dollar verdict. I think with interest and costs and expenses, it's going to be closer to twenty two or twenty three million dollars. Um, you look back, and you've had those four hours of sleep. You know, you've had those double day, 16 hour work days for months before that. Um, your family's gone through a lot. You've gone through a lot. The clients have gone through a lot. Now there's appeals work to be done. Um, give me kind of a post verdict summary overall. I mean, give me just about anything. I mean, you know, I'd put here, you know, reflect on, on your journey and how it was and whether any lessons you learned. But if there's something else that doesn't even quite fit, looking back now, post verdict, post all of this that we've discussed today, is there any highlights or anything that you would say, hey, here's something that's really important, both for attorneys and for people? Sure. I think for this one, it's it goes back to why we do what we do, and it's for the client. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times we gauge our success after, uh, off of you know the client's expectation and how the client feels at the end. And for this one, you know, Monica told us at the end, Mikey would have been happy if he just got a couple apologies, people accepting responsibility and a thousand dollars. It's he didn't care about the money. Um, you, you know, we cared about getting him a better quality of life, mm -hmm. but he's okay. Mm -hmm. And then Monica was incredibly grateful to see, you know, I got emotional in closing, telling his story. The jury got emotional. There was even a point um, after or before the verdict was read that the judge was emotional wow. and everyone felt Mikey's story and mm. everyone believed his story. And, you know, I think wow. this case has changed my life. I think it changed the jury's lives, possibly the judge's life. Mm. And I really wow. hope that the end result can change Mikey's. That's awesome. Page. Jessica summed it up perfectly. She said <laughs> right? exactly what Mike I was going to say. <laughs> <Mike> um, <drop. laughs> you know, it's interesting. After the verdict was read, um, you know, the jurors were very emotional and they, they quickly left uh, because they were so emotional. And um, I had to leave the courtroom because I was crying as well. And I was pacing the halls in tears. Um, and I think the defense attorney saw me and I was embarrassed. And I wasn't crying because I was disappointed in the verdict. I was crying because, wow how like i mean it was a whirlwind i mean yes. it was so emotional to 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 talk about mikey and everything that's happened to him and how he's overcome so much i mean mikey's a fighter and i think you know mikey really taught me a lot um and it's always going to be ingrained in me that you know he never gave up he was a fighter he hmm. beat all of the odds in his yeah. life you know from the time he was born um and so it really encouraged me to keep on fighting even when i'm you know I'm down and I get a bad order or, you know, a, a, a bad result um, just to keep going and, and to try to defeat the odds. Um, and so when I went home after the trial, I, I told my husband that I would need like a week to recover because because of how emotional it was. And I said, this will always, you know, have an impact on my life. He wow. will always have the client will always have an impact on my life. Wow. Yeah, that is uh, you guys did such a. Yeah, you both, as you were both just now talking, literally, I mean, I'm not kidding when I say mic drop and incredible, but literally, I'm, you know, I'm getting chills. I'm sure Anita and Gabriel probably as well. Um, it's so real um, how much you invest in the people we care for and make a difference for. And I can tell you guys that you are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. I'm so proud of both of you. Um, to, it's something that many attorneys go through their entire career, never getting a verdict of this uh, substantial recognition for your for your client um, you know taking on six law firms refusing to quit saying you know when they punch you're gonna punch back twice uh, incredible and I'm, I'm proud of you I know the whole firm is proud of you our firm um, 
celebrates victories like this as a team. You know, you guys have talked about the people that have helped you throughout this and how you, you know, uh, with each other as well as with those around you. It truly feels like a victory for everyone with the approach that uh, that you guys took to this. So thank you. Thank you both. And thanks for doing this today. I know you guys you guys don't get to <laughs> always jump over here in front of the camera, but you guys are awesome. They're going to be wanting to get you over here more. Um, uh, so with that, you guys, uh, if you're watching, thank you. I know today went long, um, but it's hard, to, it's hard to go through something like this and, and do it with, any, with the meaning it deserves um, and try to cut corners and make this you know, 20 or 30 minutes. So hope you're able to watch the whole thing. And if not, I hope we can put this in where you can watch sections that you like. And if you like when we do things like this, please let us know. Um, give us comments below. You know, we've said before, we like the five-star ratings. The reason that we do is it bumps us up in the ranking so that other people will watch. And again, our whole purpose here, our whole mission, part of what we believe in at the core and throughout our entire Ramos Law family is changing people's lives, making a difference, doing things that matter. Um, when we hit the end of the road in our lives, we want to have touched a lot of lives. And we're only able to do that through things like this anyway. If you share it with others, share it with your friends, give us, uh, you know, the uh, whatever these appropriate accolades and all this, this stuff works so that other people will watch, other people will see because we do want to make a difference. As you can tell, we're making a difference. And, um, and if you like these types of presentations, tell us, we'll put more up. Feed us what you want and we'll give it back because we want to be meaningful in life and make a difference. So thank you for your time today. Um, uh, please follow us. Please give us any comments, both uh, constructive, any criticism, anything we, we like, because we're here to serve. Uh, thank you. Have a nice day.